was a storm that swallowed a city. Most of America's fourth largest city is now underwater. Coronavirus infections have passed the half million mark worldwide. It's becoming more dangerous to live on this planet for a lot of reasons. Floods and wildfires and tornadoes are always happening in the United States. I have no idea whether the big threat, you know, next year is going to be from things are too hot or things are too cold, whether it's going to be floods and earthquakes or pandemics and locusts. Not a clue. There's some stuff that you can't just sit back and be a bystander for. The Caribbean island nation of Haiti has been rocked by its biggest earthquake in more than 200 years. The worst disaster in United Nations history. A 7.1 magnitude earthquake killed anywhere between 220,000 and 300,000 people. The United States is offering our full assistance to Haiti. We will be providing both civilian and military disaster relief. In early January 2010, I had been out of the Marine Corps for 60 days. And the news broke about the Haiti earthquake. Today, it hit just 14 miles from the capital city, Port-au-Prince. The U.S. Geological Survey reported a magnitude of 7.0, the largest ever recorded in that region. I sat there and I watched it for a long time. The devastation, the hopelessness, and the despair, and all those things, and, you know, wanted to act. I, I kind of thought back to that day on 9-11 when I kind of felt a similar impulse to do something and serve, but didn't find the courage to do it. And so I, I started calling around. I called one of my buddies. Maybe an hour later, another Marine, William McNulty, called me, said he wanted to go and we were off. While on our way through the Dominican Republic, we met three other individuals, each just kind of motivated and inspired to act. Um, you know, two doctors and a former Army Special Forces medic named Mark Hayward. We might want to focus on what we can do today rather than having to trust your fuck. I was a self-deploying solo responder. So I was planning to fly into Santo Domingo and the Dominican Republic and figure it out as I went along. When we got into the DR, we linked up with uh, Brother Jim Boynton, who I think was absolutely instrumental in us all being sane at the end of this thing. Well, tell us what, but, uh, uh, tell us what you're doing here. I'm down Haiti. here. I am I'm running a school in Juana Met. I was the contact in Haiti when the earthquake happened. Shortly afterwards, I was contacted by William McNulty. We set up a Skype and set up a plan to get the guys in the country, and I was their host when they were in the country. Notices were coming out of Port-au-Prince about riots and looting and vandalism and shootings. I remember just thinking, holy catfish, what am I getting myself into? So looking at Jake, looking at Will, looking at the whole team, I remember feeling pretty safe. I said, all right, I'll be all right with these guys. We got into Port-au-Prince, there were eight of us. We had honestly no idea what we were in for. The next day, we went to a camp and it was like this spontaneous displaced persons camp. It was, it was crazy. I think Jake said, wow, he said, this is, looks like Fallujah. And immediately, our guys started working. Get all that stuff over there by the table. Oh, crushing and three. there was a lot of wounded. I remember going to get broken uh, panels out of a window to make splints for people and then helping to splint it up. So Clay, how many crutches did you make today? Six. Six crutches. Clay could make crutches and splints out of anything. In piles of trash and debris in Haiti, he built some of the best crutches and splints that I've ever seen. And he had this boundless energy about him. If he had a task, he was amazing at doing it. I have a special skill set that the uh, United States government paid a lot of money to uh, train me with, so might as well use it. To the rest of the world, this is a really dangerous situation, right? This is Haiti, Port-au-Prince, post-earthquake. And to Clay, it was like he felt so safe. 
you know, because people weren't shooting at him. So he was getting to use his skills and feel like he wasn't in danger. That building right there, we could even set something up on the roof of it so we could have here. It was incredible just to see how much impact a small group of people could have. And it was like that for the next several days. They were one of the only aid groups that was also broadcasting information out to the rest of the world. You know, we are constantly updating throughout the day via BlackBerry, like loading pictures constantly, like letting people know what's going on. We started to realize something bigger than any of us was happening when we got word through Jake's family, Jake's sister especially, who were sort of telling the story. We were posting like day one, this is how many patients we saw, this is how many rescues we did, um, this is how many bones we set. And then it just, you know, started like again snowballing and people started hearing about it and you know, it became viral 10 years ago. People are following us in the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and People are sending money. People are volunteering. People are like, look, we want to help too. How do we become a part of this? Crossing into Haiti, it was like their Rubicon, which was a, a military thing that people talked about with Caesar when he decided to cross the Rubicon River. That's when Team Rubicon was formed. <laughs> I look back on our time in Haiti, and we walked away with the belief that we could build something special. So when they got back from Haiti, they had started this nonprofit that uses veterans to respond to disasters. Yellow is work orders, red's work requests. The things that we learn in the military, that we're taught in the military, are a skill set that we bring to the disasters, bring that order to chaos. If not, stand by, and we're going to load up in our vehicles and get out of here. First responders and veterans have the ability to work in austere environments. That's a pretty obvious one. The ability to work within a diverse team, the ability to be thrown into a new situation and be able to make sense of it in quick order. We are going to do something, whether it's small or whether it's big. And whether we're moving one pile of bricks from here to the curb, okay, let's get it done. Line up, let's go, let's do it. They ended up like getting to areas that other aid workers were just not able to get to. They get trained for a certain skill set, and then they may deploy or they may get to do that, but they still have that skill and they still have that desire to serve in that way. You know, what was really interesting in those first days, like you couldn't tell anybody no. There was a different sort of structure within the organization, which understandably they can't have to this day. If you had to circumvent police checkpoints, we did it, but we would get back into these neighborhoods because we knew that they needed help. And in the early days, we just went out and we did it. Anybody that's gonna get shit done and not fuck it up, and that's our attitude, and that's what's in our, our taglines. A lot of people are like, oh, that's offensive. Well, if it's offensive, then maybe these other organizations are for you, but for us, the beards and the tattoos, sweat next to your brother and your sister. I mean, that's who we're all about. I would say that this sort of cowboy cowgirl mentality kind of continued for uh, quite a bit. You know, they were a rebellious group at the beginning. And then they realized if they needed to be taken seriously, they needed to start having some rules. The other eight organizations at first, I think, were just like, what are these people? Where are they coming from? They tried to be this disruptor. Um, but then they quickly realized they were pissing people off. Well, so they were taking the streets from the side. All of our cultures were getting staged. We really had to scratch and claw ourselves to relevance over the first couple of years. We were told time and again that our idea was novel, but it couldn't scale. We were told that it was clever, but it couldn't be sustained. And like most good entrepreneurs, we ignored them. Uh, we put one for the chairman. 
be safe. It's just, yeah. There was times when I was afraid for Jake, for his mental state. They're good. They're good. Everybody's doing good out there. I do know he felt invigorated when he came back from Haiti. Gave him a, like a purpose. There's the opportunity for the veterans to be the leaders in, in the communities across the country to be the people that when crisis happens, the communities look to and say, what do we do now? And that's, that's something special, guys. So many people who are in the military and leave the military have a letdown feeling or a, a feeling of, what's my purpose? And at some point, they take that uniform off for the last time, and that band of brothers and sisters that they had in the military is gone. I'm, gonna, I'm willing to sit sort of down. Everybody has shared their story. You'll get a handful of people who share about the day, but then you'll get two handful of people who share things that they experienced in the military and how they feel like they got that camaraderie back out here in the field in Team Rubicon. By the time I had retired, and certainly by the time my son was killed in action, I had a, a lifetime of trauma that I had refused to deal with. Team Rubicon allowed me to work with other veterans who were going through the same things. I got to serve with some, some Marines who served with my son. This uh, young man came up to me and he goes, my name is Ms. Ryan Rubinskis and I served with Michael uh, in, in Iraq. We were in the same squad together and it was just such a good feeling to work alongside somebody who had shared so much with my son. Doesn't matter what service you're from, the structure is something that uh, veterans yearn for. They grew up in it. It's something that comes naturally to them. And so what better place than, than TR? Strike Teams Alpha, Bravo, Charlie will conduct debris removal with Project Homecoming at the church. We also have the first responders and those civilians who dare to be part of us as well, which is pretty special. They're looking for something in their lives, and they come to TR and they find that. What I've identified is the same things that veterans need a lot of times when they leave service. First responders need too, and we're gray shirts. The gray shirt is the uniform. When disaster strike and Team Rubicon descends upon a community, it's how you can look out and see where TR is by the gray shirts that are out there getting the work done. And it's something that's earned. When you actually have that gray shirt on, that is your badge, if you will, of like, Welcome, welcome to the team. There were so many veterans who were like, get me in the game. Like, <laughs> I wanna do this. Get me out there. Just like Clay. Buddy he was my best man at my wedding. He's been my best friend for the last few years. Gotta be here. But we were just plowing ahead. I'm here to help, I'll be here till uh, he goes home. And I so still we want really to. committed to building a professional organization. We dropped all of the other ancillary things in our life and just focused on this full time um, right around the spring of 2011. Yeah, you know, while you guys are out there and, and doing your thing, there's a whole staff of people and we have been locked into a single office room for the last week, working 18 hours a day, sleeping on a linoleum floor. When Clay got home, for him it was like, this is what I want to be doing with the rest of my life. This is the beginning of my life's work of trying to make our country and our world a better and happier place. And my absolute intention was to build an organization up to hire him someday. We had this fundraiser in San Diego to hopefully bring in some money for the org. <laughs> then that day, on the way to the fundraiser, we found out that Clay shot himself. We found out that he had killed himself. Um, <clears throat> I got a phone call that said he had uh, he committed suicide, and that was uh, that was when we all just sort of came together and tried to figure out how and why it happened. Like, what did, what didn't we do? Clay was and is such an important part of Team Rubicon's history. His death in the spring of 2011 it rocked the organization. We were a young organization. You know, he was one of my best friends, guy I'd served with on two tours, sniper partners, everything. So both personally and, and for the organization, it, it left this huge void. Oh, excuse me. 
Um, his mom called me this weekend and we were catching up, so. Clay was one of the smartest, strongest people I've ever met. He cared deeply about humanity. I think he was impatient with why there wasn't more good in the world. I know I blamed myself after he killed himself because I knew that I hadn't been as good a friend to him as I could have been, and I hadn't done whatever it was that I should have done to help him reintegrate into a community in a way that he needed. It just hit home, like, real close. And uh, I think it all made us sort of look in the mirror and think about our own mental health. We weren't deploying enough, especially on the domestic side, to really engage someone like Clay as much as we needed to. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't able to save Clay. So we just started coming up with ideas to try to get more folks engaged more often. And the domestic operations were an example of that. Team Rubicon did some really amazing things to respond to that, getting away from international medical response to you know, fairly straightforward chainsaws and hammers response to local communities and local people who needed help. And there was such an opportunity to engage those veteran volunteers on a much more consistent level. They responded to the suburb of Dallas. They responded to some flooding in Illinois. They responded to Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy is more than 200 miles off the coast and is about to crash into two other systems when it makes landfall. Winds now at 90 miles per hour, and this storm is so big, so vast, 60 million Americans will feel its power. You know, about three weeks before Sandy hit, my director of finance pulled me aside and said, she said, Jake, we're running out of money. Here in New York tonight, there is already a state of emergency. Authorities are scrambling to keep more than 8 million people safe here. And then Sandy hits New York. We know that we don't have very much money, but we know that if we can execute a mission in this circumstance, that it might be that game-changing scenario that we've been waiting for. So we make this bold call to deploy every volunteer that we could across the country. We would basically put all of our chips on the table and push them in and just go all in. And we knew that it was a roll of the dice. But it worked. And it saved the organization. And not just saved, but it, it put us on a different playing field. We did some really great and innovative things in New York City. Emergency management agencies were starting to pay attention to what we were doing. It gave us credibility when prior to that, we didn't have any. My basement was flooded. Men came in, they ripped out Shiva, flooring, carried everything to the curb. These guys in gray t-shirts, you see them, and you know these are the people that are going to help because I didn't know what to do. When we couldn't do the work ourselves, Team Rubicon came in. I saw a group of young people that just lifted, carried, didn't care. They did what they had to do to help us. Some of the first kind of waves of changes we had to make were after Hurricane Sandy, <laughs> which was our largest domestic response at that point in time. And we realized that we needed some things in place. One of the big changes we made in those first few years of growth was adopting the incident command system, which was relatively unusual for a nonprofit, but it helped us gain trust and credibility much more quickly with professional emergency managers, and I think that really helped us grow quickly in a positive way. You know, there were a bunch of big missions after that, big moments, big opportunities that we kind of rose to the occasion, but I would say the one that was kind of the next real game changer for us was in 2017 with Hurricane Harvey. 
Hurricane Harvey, now a Category 4 storm slamming into the Gulf Coast of Texas. Rescue crews worked all night long in Houston, pulling stranded people out of vehicles and homes. Even the most dire warnings couldn't prepare people here for the amount of rain that's fallen in the last 24 hours. The situation is unfortunately dire. People trapped in their flooded out homes. They are fleeing to their attics, taking to social media, begging for a rescue. Lost everything in the storm. I see a future with our church because of Team Rubicon. Hurricane Harvey hit, and so uh, donations increased. And at that point, we had enough donations to pivot the organization and start thinking about the long-term future. We have to try and find and figure out the, the organization way. grew by an order of magnitude after Harvey. And really, that was the time that Team Rubicon almost became a household name. We got a problem, too many vets are unemployed. Our aim is to get people to understand each other better for the good of the veteran community. Team Rubicon is a nonprofit disaster response organization. The organization was founded after the earthquake in Haiti. We've done about 75 missions around the globe and here at home since then. Team Rubicon, a nonprofit made up of veterans who respond to disasters at home and around the world. We were responding to superstorm after superstorm after superstorm. It wasn't just Harvey, it was Hurricane Irma in Florida and Maria in Puerto Rico. Hard work in the pursuit of a common goal forces collaboration and appreciation. And I have to believe that if we all served in an infantry platoon or played on a championship team, that we'd care more about what we have in common than what makes us different. The passion alone would not have carried this organization to where it is today. And so I think about those days and how it literally was like bootstrapping. I think if one thing defines this organization, it's that it's, it's a learning organization. It's humble enough to know what it doesn't know, and it's confident enough to go out and learn those things. As technology and resources came more available, we continue to like rise with that, step up our quality, hire people who really knew what they were doing, and it just continued to grow from there. In some ways, we've grown faster in a decade than I ever knew would be possible. We have 100,000 volunteers across the country. Our membership base is usually somewhere between 75 to 80% military veterans, 20, 25% first responders, kick-ass civilians, you know, a variety of complementary, like-minded backgrounds and roles ranging from instruction to finance to logistics to planning, all different specialty areas. I think some of the growing pains, and it's not just indicative of TR, is balancing growth with not losing sight of the vision and the strategy, because there is a tendency to grow, grow, grow as fast as you possibly can, and balancing that growth and that trajectory, and being able to keep and maintain the culture, the great culture that we've been able to build so far. All the tools and resources are there, and that's why, like, the payoff there is that the community gets to receive the benefits from these people doing that and that self-improvement through disaster response. I think it's very important for gray shirts to be a part of the fabric of the communities that Team Rubicon serves in. It definitely increases the level of ownership for safety. It increases the level of ownership for this concept of like truly building resilient communities. Currently, the long-term future strategy is the 300 resilient cities, and so there's a couple cities who've written us in their emergency management plans, and that's kind of step one. We want to be part of that. We want people to lean on us and know that, hey, don't worry about that. We have it, and we'll take care of that. It also inspires people in those communities to do more, to volunteer, to help their neighbor. We as People on Earth, human beings, need to be more attentive to the people to the left and the right of us. I think it's important to have a diverse range of individuals within the organization, but even more important than that is uh, individuals who are compassionate to diverse perspectives. 
I can definitely relate to every homeowner. Um, sometimes it's on a personal level. There's been houses that we've done, and they remind me of my grandfather or my grandmother, because it's like, what would I want the community to do if that was my 70-year-old grandmother or grandfather? So it's good. It makes my heart smile to know that, like, we've done our job. Like, we've not only served the local community, but we're serving our community within. There is definitely a vision for TR to not just be in a disaster scenario. It is also building out a team more prepared for future disasters. We focused on domestic for a while, and now we're starting to get into the international space in a grander scale. We just finished uh, Mozambique after the cyclones. We're at the Marshall Islands after the dengue breakout. Any type of disaster response, we can help. And so TR is definitely the disaster response organization of today, and I foresee it of, of the future. This organization has been constantly reinventing itself from the beginning. It's been a long march over our first 10 years. Sitting here today, the growth has been tremendous. The team has, uh, with the help of whether it's technology and our, our corporate partners, really honed in on the strategy and the execution. But it really is more around, okay, so then what is next? Today, Team Rubicon is announcing a new initiative. It's an initiative designed to get all 110,000 of our gray shirts into this fight against COVID-19. The initiative is called Neighbors Helping Neighbors, and it is a call to action for gray shirts of Team Rubicon to perform individual acts of service to help vulnerable neighbors in a way that can add value. The goal is for us to be an enabler in social distancing and quarantine efforts. We've leveraged a whole group of volunteers that probably didn't have a place before. And I think that's where we've had to prove ourselves and hopefully we've done it. And I, I sure hope my colleagues and the people that are still in that space look at us as friends and resources. In 2010, we started as eight guys with an idea. That guiding principle now animates this enormous, beautiful, multifaceted, totally different organization. You can see these big, tough, tattooed, bearded people, veterans going out there and working with these homeowners and crying with them and hugging with them. And our membership are those people out there. You know, they're, they're blue collar, they're, um, they're service oriented, they're people that are no different than the people we try to serve in, in tragedy. I love Team Rubicon because of that. Once you're a gray shirt, you're a gray shirt. I'm a gray shirt, I've earned it now, and so I, I plan on this being part of my life. Yeah, once a gray shirt, always a gray shirt. I'll be driving down the street, and you name it, and I'll see a Team Rubicon a bumper sticker, and I am absolutely amazed at the impact that this organization has had, not only on its members, but on what the members have done in making the world a better place. And as humans, we've all had some kind of trauma that's touched us in some way, shape, or form. I can understand that, not even as a Marine or a firefighter or anything else, just as Mike Washington. It's not all of us, I think, because we're, we're human beings first. When we think about this organization, we, we often look to that legacy of service as inspiration. You know, this idea that we can all be better citizens because it's the right thing to do. I think a lot of people would credit Clay with a lot of that. I damn sure know that that's what Clay would have done and did do and would have wanted me to do, is to take what I've got and do something useful for somebody else with it. Um, you know, how else, how else do you continue to express your love for somebody who's not around anymore, you know? disasters are and have been on an incline for the last 10 years. So I think that Team Rubicon's immediate challenges moving into the future are recruiting and retaining a group of people that are willing to deploy anywhere, anytime, to utilize technology and conduct operations at the highest standards. 
We have millions of veterans out there that we still need to tap into. When I speak with others and tell them about what we're actually doing in Team Rubicon, the overwhelming reaction is it just makes so much sense. We learned a lot in the early days. I think now Team Rubicon has proven itself very well and has developed the policies and the procedures and has integrated itself very well into the disaster management system of the U.S. And now I think aid groups see the value and the role that military veterans can play. I think Team Rubicon shows principle, uh, whether it's us, another organization, we can all work towards making this place better. And so I think the Team Rubicon is a uh, guiding light for other organizations to show them that, that it can be done. We just kind of laugh, you know, um, thinking about where we were and what we thought we knew and, and now where we are. And as I look at, you know, what the potential is over the next decade, over the next century, we'll continue to rise to meet the challenge. The mission is nowhere near.